All right. Thank, thank you all very much. Uh, it's been exciting uh, for me to be here at PyCon. I'm a South Carolina native, so we came a, a little way to get, to get here. And uh, so I want to talk to you today about some of the work we've been doing at PocketDoc uh, to help uh, both uh, move faster and help facilitate more change more quickly by using Python and also running that faster by using uh, PyPy to execute that Python code. So if we uh, flip to the slides here, I kind of did a quick outline. If we were to do this talk in Python, we might uh, have a few function calls or method calls here that would uh, discuss a little bit about healthcare for those that aren't uh, familiar with that. We'll talk about some of these standard transactions that are exchanged as part of uh, conducting a healthcare transaction. Um, and then we'll also talk about some of the things that we're doing to build things quickly in Python and running it fast with PyPy. And I did a version of this talk, and then I kind of went back through it, and I realized that without an appropriate uh, context manager, some of the things may not make sense. So we'll spend a few moments at the beginning applying a context manager to some of this to hopefully uh, better introduce it and give folks uh, a little bit different perspective. So let's, let's travel down the road to PyCon. I know everyone traveled a little bit different road to get here and, and, and during their life. So I grew up in Clifton, South Carolina, and just down the road from my house, you'll see signs like this. It's a tractor, and you see a lot of tractors kind of moving about. Uh, and I grew up in South Carolina, spent all my life there. And in high school, I had a really good teacher, and that man taught me that ignorance breeds ignorance. And I want you to kind of keep this quote in your mind and imagine, you know, there's a guy from South Carolina wearing overalls that's, that's giving you this quote from a public school in South Carolina. So let's keep, let's keep that in mind as we go through this talk. Um, and I also want to take a brief moment to recognize some folks that were instrumental in getting me into computing. When I grew up, I didn't really have a computer. Uh, I didn't really do much with computing until I got to college. And uh, these were some of the three professors that helped me out a lot, Dr. Olds, Dr. Varn, and Dr. Shiflett. She was actually the chairman of the department. And so as I was coming up, uh, most of my interaction was with her. So I didn't realize there weren't really that many women in computing until I got out uh, into industry. And so I just wanted to thank her. She recently retired, and I think she would be well pleased to see a lot of the folks that have shown up at PyCon that are, uh, I think, ready to pick up her torch that she carried for so many years to uh, inspire other folks to do uh, big things in computing. And so based on some of their work, uh, I got into rural computing. A lot of the best problem solvers I met uh, in graduate school and after, I found out they all came from small towns in the South and South Carolina and really all over the world. And they have a different perspective sometimes, and I wanted to do more uh, to, to encourage those folks to do more in computing. And so uh, I would come home and complain to my wife a lot that there weren't meetups and there weren't other things that a lot of folks maybe in the Bay Area or other places enjoy um, and have access to. And so I wanted to do more of that in our uh, small town in South Carolina and in other towns like it. So I got together with some other folks, and we started a nonprofit to equip, educate, and encourage more folks to do things uh, with computing. And as a result of that, we kind of live near another city that's known as the Hub City. It's where all the trains intersected for all the old textile mills. And, uh, and it's called the Hub City because it was a hub for that. And so we kind of started a, our own little Python user group a few years back. And I, I told him I would do this. I wanted to put Trey Bailey from Cowpens, South Carolina, on the board. We didn't have a very good spot to meet up, but this is the back of an old furniture store that allowed us to put our projector up and review some code. And so throughout this process, I was uh, working to, to kind of build up more awareness for some of the really good folks doing things in rural areas. And... Uh, but a lot of folks didn't really understand that. They kept thinking I was trying to introduce folks to do better PowerPoint presentations and whatnot. And as you can tell from some of these slides, I'm not the person you really want to talk to if, you, if you're looking to make a super-duper presentation. But along my uh, path in industry, I met up with a couple of folks that were really inspirational for me. And so as I was facing problems encouraging more people to do things in the rural areas and those folks not really understanding... I met up with Lisa and Ted, and at the time, they were working on a number of projects, and I asked them, I said, hey, I would like to work with you all, um, because my family was also going through some health care problems at the time, and so I've got this passion for helping folks in rural areas, and I also understand there's a lot of complications everyone deals with in health care. And so in 2011, I, I joined up with uh, Ted and Lisa as the first engineer uh, officially to sign on the dotted line to join the company, um, and I've been working with a lot of really good folks over the years with them, and I just can't say enough about these folks. I, when I speak about them, it's like they're my extended family, not really like a, a company. So I just appreciate all that they've done to help me. And now... Healthcare. So I can't say it quite like John Oliver would, but we're going to try to do our best. And as uh, many of you all know, it impacts all of us, regardless of our gender or religion or race or anything like that. So it's a very important problem that we all should be focused on. 
One of the things that gets folks riled up sometimes about health care is who pays? Do I pay? Do you pay? Does someone else pay? Is there some coordination of paying? And it all gets really complicated. And then when you add technology into these, some of these health care problems, folks get further uh, frustrated because uh, a lot of things in health care aren't as easy as like maybe uploading a photo of your dinner. And it's hard for some of the established folks to change because they've acquired a number of systems over the years and they don't talk to each other and they don't necessarily have time to uh, redo everything. So they're trying to keep things running. And it's difficult for new folks to enter because there's this tremendous uh, barrier that you have to cross to get into the healthcare uh, business. And so that kind of makes a lot of folks sad and they kind of shrug, maybe walk off and don't necessarily consider doing things in healthcare. But there are a lot of things that we can help fix, even if we're not politicians or, or not actively involved in, in policy making decisions, things like that, like if we're working in tech. Uh, we can make it easier for you to check your own healthcare information. Have I met my deductible? Am I covered for this service? We can make it easier for healthcare providers to get paid, those providers that are really good providers that are out there trying to make a difference and just want to help folks without this extra administrative burden. And this list could go on and on and on. So one of those professors I showed you earlier, Dr. Olds, he told me one day, he's like, Brian, you know, one of the great things about standards is that there's so many of them. And in healthcare, that's absolutely true. The more I started working in healthcare, the more people started rattling off these transaction set codes to me. You give me a 271, 270, 276, 277, and they just go on down the list. And after a while, you just kind of glaze over, and you're not quite sure what's going on. But uh, trust me, all these really do map to something that really happens. Um, but I wanted to point out, too, that I tried to put the number of pages in some of these claims, uh, like for claims there, and some of these specifications, like in just the professional claims specification, not any one's particular implementation guide, that's 704 pages. So if you're having trouble sleeping at night and you don't want to take additional medications or anything, I can recommend that you go to read that and it'll put you to sleep pretty quick. And so some of the folks uh, back at Pocket Doc have worked really hard to try to help folks visualize how these transactions fit together because it gets really complicated very quickly. Um, and for folks that have really good technical ideas but they're new to healthcare, we've been trying to help them implement their ideas more quickly. And so as you can see here, you enroll in benefits. Once you're enrolled, you can check your eligibility. You can potentially get authorized for a service. And after that, you can file claims, check the status of those claims. You could do that in a whole kind of loop. And then if you don't like your plan, you could change and re-enroll and go through that process again. So let's look at some of the uh, X12 uh, raw data. And here's just a sample snippet that I kind of grabbed and wanted to use to introduce folks to these transactions that might not be familiar with them. So each uh, X12 healthcare transaction, like the other X12 transactions that exist for other industries, have this notion of an envelope. So there are these two records that kind of bookend all the data in between. And inside that envelope, there's a functional grouping of transaction sets. And then inside that grouping, there's a transaction set. And there can be one or more of these transaction sets. So you can kind of see, I've indented it on this slide, but it's, there's this notion of this looping that can happen. So these files can be really, really small and just contain one transaction. They can be really, really big and contain a whole bunch. And so let me show you what the the guts of one of these transactions might look like. Here's a claim. This is one of my own claims because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of this data is HIPAA protected, but I can give you all my data that I want, and it's okay. Uh, so uh, this is one that I had recently just for a routine physical, and it's just a snippet. Um, but you can see in here, like, the SV1 segment ID there, that's, that's like a line item on a receipt. So if you go buy something at the store, they'll give you a receipt and say you got this product or this service. And so in the healthcare claim, it's very much like that. I got this procedure, 99214, and I paid 70 bucks for it, and so on. A lot of times, though, these uh, transactions aren't even this well formed. A lot of times it'll be on one line. And so you end up like trying to scroll forever to figure out what's going on. It's just not a, a very uh, intuitive way to work through some of this stuff. So at Pocket Doc, one of the things we've been doing uh, is, and we work in Python quite a bit, so we've been working to make sure that we can easily convert to and from uh, a dictionary representation of these transactions because it's easier for us to work with and, and review and even talk with our EDI team and other uh, folks in the healthcare business about this data. And they don't have to uh, get mired up in all of those older uh, transactions unless they want to. And so uh, folks that draw and visualize things better than I do uh, helped uh, make this for some customers at PocketDoc to help them kind of understand the flow of transactions through our system and other systems that may be doing similar kind of transactions. And uh, one of the main things I just kind of want to highlight here, if you can see it, is uh, there's a couple of indicators uh, as this workflow progresses that says, well, it may be about 24 hours before you get back an acknowledgement for this claim transmission. Or it might be one to two weeks 
before you hear whether or not your claim is made it into this adjudication process and it might be uh, paid. And then if there's additional paperwork required, it may take even longer. And so a lot of times I'll ask folks, well, why does it take one to two weeks? Or what happens between this point and this point? And uh, one of the answers I get a lot is, well, that's just the way we've always done it. And uh, you might expect in the South, they say that for other things too, maybe incorrectly. And I just wanted to kind of mention this, that my grandma, she made the best fried okra I've ever had. And I've never found anybody else that had any fried okra like grandma. That's about the only thing that that's the way we've always done it should be used for. So, so if it's your grandma's fried okra, it's okay. If it's, if it's something in healthcare or something in other industry, you always want to make uh, an, an examination of it and see if you can do a little bit better. Or if it's a new group, you want to you know, treat them well. You, you don't, may not know anything about them. And so just another quick little summary here. In healthcare, there's a couple things that, that challenge us along the way. A lot of folks are too big to move quickly. My brother recently shared a video on YouTube with me of a V8 chainsaw that was out here, I think, in Portland or Washington State, and I was really impressed by it. My brother thought it was great, but it's a V8 engine on a big chainsaw, and it takes a couple of big folks to move it around to get it over the log that they're cutting up. And that's kind of what I visualize when folks say they can only use enterprise products to do things. Uh, when we move with Python, we move a lot quicker, um, but you know, a lot of folks unfortunately get so caught up in these specs that I just walked you through, they never get to actually implementing anything or making the first transaction get across the wire. Um, and uh, I was telling some folks at lunch that that's kind of like the Allen Iverson segment, you know, where he was talking about practice. We were just talking about practice, not the actual game. Unfortunately, in healthcare, a lot of folks talk about specs and don't ever make it to the actual transactions. And in the South, this would compare to like pulling weeds all day in the corner of a field and never getting the field cut. So. At Pocket Doc, some of the folks I've been chatting with uh, about how we work and how I might explain it to folks, especially in rural areas, it's kind of like tractors and weed eaters. And we're trying to, eat, in each development sprint, we're trying to get the field cut, but make it still look good so it'd be a nice pastoral scene that folks would want to come by and admire. So one day I was walking through my f uh, field between my house and my brother's house. We live on some land in South Carolina. And he comes home with this on his trailer. And I said, man, what are you going to do with that? What is that? He goes, man, this is a field mower. He goes, I'm calling my buddy Reed. We're going to hook that up to the four-wheeler, and we're going to get after this field and cut it all down and make it real nice. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, but sure enough, these guys are some of the best problem solvers I know, and they came up, and that evening, within minutes, that field was cut. And then I started thinking about well, how we operate at, at Pocket Doc with some of the Python stuff. We really have been kind of operating like these guys have been making, making quick work of the work that they've been given. And so let's talk about how Python might uh, help facilitate some of that. So I look at Python like the diamond plate truck toolbox. So you know, if you know folks that have uh, big trucks or trucks, a lot of times you'll see this kind of truck, uh, truck box on the back. And this is my brother's truck. So if he rolls up to help you on a problem, he doesn't say, I'm going to come back in 6 to 18 months and I'll get with you then. He says, I got that in the truck. I'm going to help you right now. And I feel like that's, that's how I uh, view Python and some of the stuff we've been doing. And as many of you probably know, Python's really good for large and small projects. A lot of folks in healthcare will sometimes kind of come at me with, well, it's just a scripting language. Well, we built the whole platform with it, right? A, lar a large uh, system, a large application. It's got a really good standard library for a lot of the common things that you might run across in healthcare. You've got all sorts of really good language features like decorators, generators, context managers. It's just easy to tote around like my backpack. So how can we tractor with Python? I'm interactive all day. I don't know if you went to Scopat's talk the other day, but he's got some good stuff with uh, Python and Bash and merging those things together. So I'm interactive all the time. I operate one line at a time. And uh, that's been a big help to me to quickly know, does this work? Does this not work? And uh, this is kind of like the workflow I do every day. If someone calls up and says, hey, we need to get this done real fast, I kind of work through interactive evaluations, come up with snippets and tests, and I sling them right up there into a buffer. And then those snippets evolve into a library of functions, and then I ship it and circle back around so we can get something out there to meet folks' needs. And, you, and when you ship it and circle back around, it's kind of like you're driving a big truck and kind of have to turn that big wheel and come back around. So how do you weed eat? Well, there's a lot of folks on our team, like uh, Dixon Whitmire. He's one of the best guys I know at, at doing some of this. So if I sling stuff up there and uh, it's working pretty well, but there's opportunities for improvement, Dixon can come back through or any of the other folks on the team and uh, reduce any kind of du duplication. Those functions may become classes. They op we'll, we'll optimize code based on some real-world metrics we've been gathering. And it, here's an important thing. It's okay to call that tractor back if not enough was, was fixed up. I know a lot of folks don't want to have technical debt lingering. We don't either. And so this is how we deal with it. The weed eater crew can always call you back and say, hey, let's fix this up. 
So let's look at a couple of samples here uh, that we've got that we've just kind of discovered or, or stumbled across with how we process X12 with Python. One of the first things I like to point out to folks is we use context managers a lot. And so uh, you notice in that other slide where there's an X12 file, there's an X12 uh, uh, functional group and a transaction set, each of those have corresponding trailers where they have to keep up with like the segment counts and other information about what was contained in that file. But by using these context managers, we can just focus on writing out segments and doing maybe business-specific things. And when we kick out of that context manager, the trailers and the counts and everything just kind of naturally flow along. Same thing popped up with decorators. Um, as you saw earlier, the, all these segments exist, and they're all over the place. And depending on the context that they occur in, they may have different meanings associated with them. And so in this case, here's an example from a, a 271 response that contains your eligibility information. In this case, the deductible. So rather than having these funky if blocks that go on for miles, we break those up into functions, decorate them so that we can apply just those when we encounter a segment that we're processing. So in this case, we'll, we'll pick up the EB segment, we'll take the EB01 element when it's a C, and then this functional fire. And that's kind of the logic we'll load up based on the transaction set to convert these uh, raw EDI transactions into our dictionaries that we work with internally. And we make heavy use of generators, because I don't know if you've picked up anything off the shelf before, and it's highly touted as being an EDI mapper or whatnot, and then you throw the first big swole file to it, and it just totally hit, uh, out, goes out of memory and blows up. Well, with Python, as you know, we, we can use gen uh, generators to stream this data in, so we can work with it more efficiently and keep a, a lower memory footprint. So we stream in these segments, and we can work with them in a, in, a, in a raw mode, kind of just like a plain dictionary with that raw segment data. But we can also chain these generators together. So I can stream in my segments, bust those up into dictionaries, and then take those segment dictionaries and then map them into internal models so that when I'm working with it in that context, I never even really look at the raw EDI. I'm just yielding these internal dictionaries that represent transactions. So Unless there's some sort of core issue, I'm always working with these higher level transactions and I can make pretty quick work of those. And uh, as an example of that, uh, a lot of folks will tout these uh, X12 standards on and on and on. But then in practice, let's say for like the enrollment world, a lot of times what ends up happening is they ship your data around in spreadsheets or CSV files, not the X12 834 that they uh, preached a lot to you about. And so one of the things that we've done, uh, e even related to eligibility data, is folks will say, hey, we've got customers that would like to uh, use your APIs to access their eligibility data, but we can't send you an X12-271 for whatever reason. But I can send you a spreadsheet or I can send you a CSV. And so you can import CSV from the standard library. You can create a little generator that can take the dictionary representation of that row. We can quickly map it to our internal model, and then we can stream it back out as X12 as if it had come to us that way. And then we can host that data for them. Our customers can use the APIs. They never know that there was a problem behind the scenes with X12. So that's been a really cool thing uh, for us to use there. And uh, if you've noticed, all this stuff fits on a slide. So we'll, we'll get to an example in a minute that won't fit on a slide. So buckle your safety belts. We're going to accelerate and hit the, hit the last part of this talk because I know you're wondering about, well, where's PyPy come in? So in the South, you hear a lot of stuff that may sound ignorant sometimes, and I hear it in uh, the healthcare world when they talk about Python. So you'll hear stuff like, but my mama's brother's neighbor's co-worker's best friend said Python was too slow and you can't scale. And I'm like, I do my Scooby-Doo on that. I'm like, Rrr. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? I don't even know if that makes sense. But you hear it a lot, right? And a lot of organizations, both at the upper level and even lower level, will say, well, we're not going to consider that. And I think that's a mistake sometimes. So let's see, how can we make this go faster? We're going to bring in PyPy. We're going to take a Python code, run it with PyPy, and we're going to accelerate. And if you've ever seen the movie Sling Blade, this is what I imagine when I get to this slide. You know, you've got a perfectly good lawnmower here. All these folks are standing around it saying, well, it ain't working. And then Sling Blade or Billy Bob comes over and he just goes, it ain't got any gas in it. And so that's kind of what I think a lot of these folks are missing, right? They just ain't got any gas in their lawnmower. So, um, so we switched to PyPy and we've seen really good results from that. And we're going to check that out here in a second. But one thing I wanted to point out here, while we were... Uh, working through uh, a big project and running it with PyPy. We did hit a few things that I didn't expect. And in one case, uh, I had some tests that broke uh, due to some UUID generation, and I couldn't quite figure it out. But I took a moment, and I posted on their uh, issue tracker. I'm like, hey, hey, folks, uh, how you doing? Uh, I appreciate all your work, and I want to thank you for it. And I just ran across this, and um, I'm not sure what to do with it. So, you know, working in healthcare, I don't even know if I expected a response for six to eight, 18 months or whatever. 
Well, sure enough, that same day, Alex Gaynor, guy I don't even know, but, I, but I've heard a lot about and I, I respect, he shows up. He says, man, that looks pretty bad. I'm going to go ahead and fix it right now. And then, and then, sure enough, that same day service happened. He fixed it in Pi Pi, and we kept rolling. So I just wanted to mention that a lot of times, and this is something my dad always told us growing up that my grandma passed down, was that, you know, it doesn't cost you anything to be nice to somebody. And uh, that's something that stuck with me for a long time. And you see a lot of times in, in, in the tech world, you'll have a lot of people talking down to each other on pull requests and on other things. And I don't think that's right, right? We shouldn't treat each other that way. And I've found that I get a lot better results. My pull requests get processed or my issues get worked if I say, how you doing? In the South, we'd say, how's your mama in them? But we don't do, I don't do that on the pull request. <laughs> but, uh, and then, and then I, I thank them. I say, thank you all for your hard work. Because I know a lot of people putting in big time work onto this stuff, and I don't even understand half of it, right? So I respect what they're doing. So let's get to the main event. I know I'm running out of time here. Let me give you a real-world example that maybe you can take back to some of your folks that uh, may not believe in Python or may not believe in PyPy and, and, and some of the work there. So let's take some real-world uh, stuff here. So if you're familiar with healthcare, you know that each uh, healthcare provider gets a unique ID. They call it an NPI. And uh, it's used all over these X X12 transactions. It's used all over the place. And uh, just an, as an example, uh, that 146, et cetera, that's actually me. You can go get your own NPI if you work in healthcare, and you can make your specialty like a healthcare data technician or whatever the, the code is. So there's a, there, they use the LUN algorithm to do a, a checksum on this, kind of like you might do a, a credit card. And I'm not going to go into that algorithm, but it's, it, there's a good write-up on Wikipedia about that. But really, it's just designed to catch accidental errors. You know, there's a lot of typos, you know, if somebody's manually entering something. And we want to catch that before we relay it on to a, a trading partner or a payer for processing. So on that Wikipedia page, they had a Python snippet, an example implementation of the LUN algorithm that someone had posted. So I was like, that's pretty cool. Let's just do some timings of that just to show folks, well, what kind of speed-ups might you get on a real-world kind of thing with PyPy. So I did a few rounds of timings. And uh, with Python 2.7, it came out at maybe like 9.74 microseconds per loop. Python 3.5 was a little bit faster in these tests. And ran it with PyPy and went down to 1.54. So that's pretty significant. I didn't do anything but just take a snippet of Python code and ran it with a different interpreter. Well, one of my coworkers, uh, Jared Cordewan, I call him JC for short. He's a South Carolina native also, but he doesn't talk quite like I do. He's, he's a little bit more refined, I would say. But he's got a big math background, a PhD in math, I think, actually. Um, and he came over, and we were working on some new pharmacy APIs. And he said, hey, man, I think I can make that go a little bit faster. And um, so he says, you know, I, I think that's just really some integer arithmetic, maybe a lookup table or something. Here, take these four functions and, and try it out. So I'm like, you know, and it still fits on the slide. He's got a bunch of comments on it if you look at the companion, so you can, you can get the full detail there. And so while we were talking, I was like, well, let's see how that does. And uh, look at that. Pretty, I mean, this is, this is even in the non-jitted the non uh, uh, CPython, it went from like 9 to 2.21. So you got a pretty good speed up, you know, just thinking about a little bit more about how you'd solve the problem. There was a little bit of an increase in Python 3.5. I haven't had a chance to look into that yet, but uh, there may be something else going on there that I didn't expect. But in, in PyPy, look, it was like a, almost like a three times improvement there just by kind of swapping out your algorithm. And so I was like, man, JC, that's awesome. So, and then he was like, well, let's see. How long would it take to validate all the NPIs? Let's say we, in, we got tomorrow, every, every uh, healthcare provider in the U.S. said, here's a claim, let's process it, let's validate all that stuff. So another little quick snippet, again, it fits on the screen, uh, taking JC's implementation, and we're, we're going to take the, uh, the May release of the NPI data. There's a public data set out there, anybody can get it. And if you're a healthcare provider, don't put your cell phone in there. Because it's public data, and then you'll get, you'll get all these calls, and you won't know where they're coming from. So that's just a, a heads up on that. <laughs> we, we get asked that a lot. Well, how do you get my phone number? Well, it's in this data set. It's public. It's out there on the Internet, you know. Um, so anyway, I wanted to have this little snippet. I wanted to run JC's algorithm uh, a bunch to see what would happen there. And just out of fun uh, and curiosity, a lot of folks would say, well, you know, we can't use Python. We use Java. We need speed or whatnot. And I was like, all right. So let's do a Java version, too. And it's been a while since I've written any Java, so y'all might be able to do a better one than I did. So that's another reason I kind of pulled in the Apache Commons there to get their LUN algorithm. I thought that might be a little bit more fine-tuned. But you notice this, this doesn't fit on the screen. You have to go out and check the companion to see the rest of that. So let's compare them. And just, these are all rough calculations, right, like we might do in the field with my brother just tinkering with something. Run the Java version. I ran this over and over and over and over again. Got similar timings. Ran JC's algorithm in PyPy. It always beat it, every time. A lot of people don't think, think about that, right, because they never stop to learn about anybody new or anything new, and I just wanted to kind of highlight that to maybe let those folks consider something new. 
basically to say algorithms still matter, and a lot of folks don't think about that. So let's take it to the house. Um, just a quick summary of what we're going to wrap up with here, things I want you to kind of maybe take back with you. Interactive development in a JIP, it helps you tractor and go fast, and Python and PyPy are one way to do that. And one of my coworkers and friends, Gotti, would like me to remind you that closure could also be used in this case, but since we're at PyCon, I'm talking about Python. Uh, but yes, there are other alternatives out there, and folks should consider those too, because those may fit uh, you know, better with your organization. But in general, folks should be more open-minded about the tools and, and, and techniques they could use to solve some of these really important problems that we all face and that impact us all. And there's a couple of follow-up references. Uh, Brett Cannon, I got to chat with him the other day. They're doing some cool stuff with Pigeon to make it easier for folks to bolt on the JITs of the future. And he's got a really good uh, summary, uh, a good survey of other Python interpreters if this is kind of interesting to you. And he does a much better uh, job at recapping all of that than I could ever do. If you're more interested in the LUN algorithm and those uh, NPI checksums, you can check that out. And I've got a little repo on GitHub, and I've got a Docker image out there too if you want to take this and run it on your machine to see what's up. And thank y'all. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time for uh, for questions. So what I would encourage you is to talk to Brian on the hallway or open an open open space. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you.